welcome everybody. Um, we've, we hope to present this as a fairly fluid session. I would like to just um, start off by um, just saying a bit about poisons. Um, the, I think the title of this was Tainted Pictures, which I thought was rather, rather nice. And um, it, it's all about poisonous photography. And um, what Sean and I have done, we've, we've brought out um, a, a range of cameras for you to, to look at to see um, that, that illustrate the development of, of um, the making of cameras over, over the centuries. And uh, we've also targeted um, various photographic processes that, that use um, hazardous um, photochemicals. So poisons, I, I'd like to just quote from um, uh, Paracelsus. He was a German Swiss Renaissance physician and alchemist and father of toxicology. He once wrote, everything is poison. There is poison in everything. Only the dose makes a thing, not a poison. Um, so a very brief definition would be poison is anything that kills or injures through its chemical actions. Poisons can enter the body by swallowing, swallowing or ingesting, uh, breathing, or, the, or that's inhaling, absorption through the skin. Um, people vary in their sensitivity to chemicals. Um, exposure to hazardous chemicals can, can be caused by carelessness or a lack of uh, suitable facilities, lack of adequate ventilation uh, in the dark room, for instance, uh, not following safe handling practices. And Sean is very fond of um, pointing out he's just using his naked hands there. And I've heard stories of um, photographers that have worked for the Herald who, who developed skin disease in their fingers. And um, the fingers go kind of very almost a black colour, and um, you know they're just um, safe handling would be using tongs. But um, um, I was discussing this with Sean, and we we're saying, well, you know, in 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 the newspaper industry, um, speed is of the essence, and um, so they they develop a, a degree of carelessness when they're r rushing to get images to the press. And they tend to have their lunch in the dark room as well. <laughs> yeah. Lack of ventilation. Lack of adequate ventilation. Um, risk taking. Um, sometimes photographers will make a conscious choice to use dangerous chemicals when safe alternatives are available. Mm -hmm. It might be that the, the dangerous chemical um, achieves a, a, an end result that, that's more aesthetic. Or, or it may be that the dangerous chemical speeds up the process. Um, and then, of course, accidents. Accidents can happen in the dark room. Um, now, the other thing to, to consider, too, is the accumulative effect of exposure to chemicals over a long period of time and, and um, uh, sensitizing. Um, the other conclude that by just saying that um, we, we're more, we're probably more aware of a lot of the hazards of these photochemicals today um, than, than in the past. Um, I did um, read, I uh, was a um, historian of photography who um, was talking about the deburotypists and how um, their use of mercury that they um, they must have um, he, he, he said described as they must have been as mad as hatters and the the, um, the hat making industry at the same time that the daguerreotype was um, in vogue in, in the uh, early 1940, 1840s um, they used mercury for processing the felt in a lot of the hats, and um, the, the people um, were exposed to the mercury, um, developed um, 
all sorts of ailments and um, uh, uh, neurological uh, problems. And, um, and of course, a lot of them died. Um, so this session is all about poisons involved in photography over history. Uh, but we will show you um, photography, um, how photography started with big heavy cameras and progressed to smaller, um, more portable cameras and eventually to the appearance of digital cameras and cell phones. Uh, another thing to consider is that uh, digital photography has limited the use of chemicals. Um, so that's a certain um, um, freedom and um, um, efficiency that um, and e ease of uh, taking photographs that um, um, wasn't the case in the past. Um, so the not to be confused with the wet plate process, which we we'll talk about but just in general terms, talking about um, this type of photography as, as wet photography, um, apart from the exposure of, of the, um, the, the image in the camera, um, the whole process involves solutions. Uh, something I just mentioned there um, about poisons and, um, and the dark room um, that um, there was two, two, type, two forms of, of uh, chemi photochemicals. Um, you could get uh, chemicals in liquid form uh, to be diluted or in power form to be dissolved. Um, the, the, the powder form was the most dangerous. There was, um, great danger of inhalation and contact with the skin. Before we switch to the 19th century, mm -hmm. in the contemporary time, I just thought I'd read out some of the warnings associated with kind of the height of this period, so up until the end of the 20th century. So it says, most developers are moderately to highly toxic by ingestion. Store concentrated acids and other corrosive chemicals on low shelves so as to reduce the chance of face or eye damage. Label all solutions carefully so as not to ingest solutions accidentally. <laughs> they say um, acetic acid, and this is the stop bath, so the middle, there's three parts of effectively the photographic process. There's the developer, so that's when you put the image in and you usually move it a little bit until the image starts to come out. There's the stop, which stops the developer from working. And then at the end, you use something called fix, and that effectively makes it stay at the end so that the chemicals can be washed and it's safe to handle after that point. In powder form, sodium thiosulfate is not significantly toxic by skin contact, but the ingestion is the problem. So um, in a darkroom sense, what happened was people were working in the darkroom and then they would go and do other things without washing their hands. So they'd have their lunch, they'd have their cup of coffee or any number of things connected to it. So most of the danger was not direct, but it was carried to the other activities going on, let's say a busy newsroom. So it's a, and that was pretty much up until the end, it was never really a safe, there was no safe procedure in place in a, a newsroom. In fact, they would skip off in this process because they didn't want them to last, they just wanted them out into the newspaper. Yeah. So there was no washing of the chemicals, the prints were covered in the stop. This, the image is on the, uh, appearing, but um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's the process of developing out the image and the um, what they called a latent image. It will be a, an, an invisible image, and, and it's developed out by the chemicals. It is actually it's actually the same picture. I think it's done another. There's actually a similar process that takes place with film. Um, Originally, they used this sort of equipment here, um, and then later on, they changed to Bakelite and then plastic containers to agitate the film. So again, you would, although in complete darkness for film, you would. Um, that's why you put it in the tank. You'd put in your developer, you'd stop it, and then you'd fix it, and then you'd take out the film. Have a look. 
the fact that, you know, photography's been reduced to the palm of your hand. Um, but it wasn't always like that. And uh, Sean and I were hunting in the connection. We, we know there is a, a big camera light risk, it's just got a single lens. Actually, um, if, if we can, we could increase the light a bit now and you can, so that you can see these a bit better. So this um, is the largest that, that we could find in the collection. We do know that there are larger ones early, in an earlier period. So this is actually more turn of the century, let's say late 19th century. And it's a full plate camera. And it would like that one there, it would extend out with bellows, something it's what enormous it's called to wield. A, a, a dry plate camera. And you, you would buy the negatives from already prepared in, in a, a light tight um, cardboard package. But this camera that's up on the screen is, is, is from the wet plate era and um, we've discussed that in a little while in the, what was called the wet collodion process um, and whereby the negative was put in the camera in a, in a moist condition and it had to be taken out of the camera and into the dark room usually a portable dark room if it was out in the field and um, and this had to be done within um, I think it was a, a maximum of 10 minutes depending on the, on the temperature but it had to remain moist. Um, the interesting thing about this particular camera is it's, it's got nine lenses so the photographer it would be a, a portrait camera and various customers coming into the uh, studio uh, that he would only expose a part of the negative and then when he's got them all exposed he'll, mm -hmm. he would um, develop the neg. For this period of negative two they were hand cut glass, they weren't industrially manufactured. So it was so much work to polish a glass plate to a good point, you know, that you could use it and cut it. That's why they would often save on the plates by putting multiple pictures on the one plate. Now here's a um, similar camera to, um, this is John, uh, a photograph by John Thompson of, of a, a street photographer in Paris. And um, you can see the big um, plate camera on the tripod, but at the little wheelbarrow is this little portable dark room. So you prepare the negatives in there, um, put them in the, in, the, in the dark slide and take them over to the camera and uh, where they'd be exposed and then back into the dark room to process them. And um, just another example of the, um, the, the, big, the big wet plate camera, that's a Dr. Barker, who's um, a very um, a wonderful photographer from 19th century South, South Island. Um, and we just, Sean and I thought it was essential to put this illustration in. Um, this just emphasises the problems of, of um, getting about with, with a big heavy camera. And um, this is um, a photographic um, supplier so put this ad in, in the, as, I think it's a Sydney paper, um, but the, the, the this chaps enlisted as dogs. It's something to remember with this period is um, everything was contact printed, so your negative was put directly onto the paper when you're printing it to make the same size print. Sure, would you like to? So, in order, order to make a 19th century print of this size, imagine the size of the camera that they would have had to carry out into the wilderness. And you'll, not, you'll notice the <laughs> terrain and they are carrying these big glass plate negatives plus all the chemicals to process the, the negatives. That's right, it all yeah, had to be done on site. Mm -hmm. You had 15 minutes from when you took the picture, or rather when you made the plate sensitive, to take the picture and develop the plate. But if it dried, it wouldn't work. So this is an image of Roger Fenton going off to the, um, the Crimean War. And um, th this is the, the big, how, how he approached the problem. Did you want to mention something about the chemicals he would have been carrying? Um, if it's wet plate, he's, he's got 
a, quite a good supply of ether in that band, <laughs> which um, tends to be quite flammable. Yeah, well, there's a war on. There's a war on. This was probably as explosive as the, as the ammunition band. That's right. Now, um, this is Louis de Gure, and in. Um, 1839, he, um, he announced the invention of this process of um, securing an image on, on a, 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 copper, a silvered copper plate. And um, it was a very dangerous um, process because um, um, it had to, um, it involved, uh, this is all the equipment, um, but, and this is a daguerreotype camera. But here we are, it show, shows you there um, the various steps in the process um, that um, the, the, um, the silver plate would be, would be polished first. Um, this silver, silver was applied, silver coating was applied to the plate, and then it was exposed to um, uh, mercury vapor. And you can see the little, um, the little Vapor box, vaporizing box with the um, with the little lamp underneath to heat it up, and um, so I've um, now this was in our collection, and it was described as a um, a photograph of Paris by Louis de Gure. But it's it's not. It's actually by another phot Bisson. another photographer, Bisson, and um, we found that out from looking on the back of the copper plate, and it had his um, his his name incised on the, on the copper. But it, nevertheless, it's still a very early daguerreotype, and um, something about daguerreotypes that um, you can go in. On, with a low resolution microscope or, or a powerful magnifying glass and you can actually read the posters on the bridge. There's lots of posters on the bridge. The and funny thing about the early ones too is they're back to front. Yes, it's, it's back to front. What had, what hadn't, it had, the daguerreotype hadn't advanced to a stage where they'd developed a reversing mirror on, on the daguerreotype camera. And of course, daguerreotypes were very popular for doing portraiture, and it didn't, doesn't matter with portrait. I mean, we all know our faces from a reversed image, which we see in the mirror anyway. So um, there we are. Um, but, but doing topographical photography, um, buildings and, and um, street scenes and so forth, landscapes, um, you would need, um, you need to reverse them. This is Henry Williams as a daguerreotype. And the other thing about a daguerreotype is it's unique. You don't have a negative where you print more and more and more. Every one is a single item, so one photograph only. As I said before, it, it was most popular and successful for portraiture. You can imagine having to count all this out in the field if you were wanting to do topographical work. Um, the, another thing about the daguerreotype was the very long exposure time, and um, it, it could range from many seconds to, to a few minutes. And you can see on the back of the seat, there's um, a rod going up with little clamps to, to hold the subject still uh, while the photographs are <laughs> A lot of the landscapes come from France, from the early invention of the process. So that's more of the exploratory process where they, were, they had a new technique. They were trying it out on subjects in the city. And then um, when it was implemented commercially, it was mostly portrait. Um, now we're on to the wet plate. Um, this is a photograph of his own camera, but he invented this process, or discovered this process, of um, using um, um, collodion, um, which was a very syrupy um, 
solution and um, coating, coating the negatives with that as, as a means of being the, the, the carrier for the, uh, the, the sensitizing photochemicals. And as I explained before, th this is the process where um, the negative had to be, um, uh, the emulsion was applied in the, in the dark room and then taken out to um, the camera and exposed and then put back in the, taken back to the camera, uh, to the, the dark room to be... Um, That's a good opportunity to, to um, give an example. He's holding the lens cap to the camera, and that's how he's actually taking the photograph. So whereas this one from the late 19th century actually has a mechanical shutter, so you'd press a button here and it, on a, a clock winder effectively it would trigger. But in this period, to take a, a photograph, you just remove the lens cap count and put it back on. <laughs> and things developed in tandem, because with the dry plate, um, the, it, what the photographers termed it was a faster emulsion, so it, it and that's got an, an instantaneous shutter on the front, as they called it. And so, as Sean mentioned, the the the, the speed of exposure was was shortened, but it was shortened not just because of the the, the uh, mechanics of the camera, but the nature of the emulsion on the, on, the, on the dry plate negatives. Um, there was very much slower um, exposure times with the wet plate, and um, you know, just use a, a lens cap. Um, so here's here's the sort of thing that would have to um, be dealt with with the uh, the wet plate photographer, um, a, a portable dark room in um, in, in which the um, the negative was treated. And then it was, would be put in, in a, um, the photographer's helpers holding a little, um, um, let's put the head one, the dry plate one out there, a little um, uh, a dark plate. slide. And that, the dark slide was a means of getting the negative from the dark room to the camera without letting the light in. And, um, there he is operating, and as uh, Sean and I have sort of observed, that um, a lot of these processes are in involving hazardous chemicals, and all the time um, the photographer's under a shroud or in the, the photographic tent. To, so there was no. Um, and in the dark. And in the dark, and <laughs> no opportunity for ventilation. So uh, here's. Um, the topographical photographer off into the field with his portable dark room and his camera gear, glass plates and, and chemicals. Um, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yep. So um, that's the wet plate collodion technique, which you can do it on a number of medium. Um, here it's on glass, but you can also do it on metal, which um, Iron plates were basically polished, and then often they put a layer of silver on them, and they would basically use it like you use a glass plate to expose the photograph onto the metal plate. So in this case, with the glass, they have to pour on. Um, they make up the collodion, which involves ether, and they um, once they have that solution, they have to quickly pour it on in a continuous way onto the plate. If there's any bubbles or ripples, they'll come out in the picture. And the corners are often marked with fingerprints because they used to hold the plate as they were pouring. There's no record that I've ever found of them wearing any gloves when they were doing this. Once it was ready, it went into a bath where it would get the silver nitrate. <coughs> and that was how it became light sensitive. And then after that point, it had to stay in the dark until it was exposed. So. That's the bath, out of there, into the camera, into one of these, and into the back of the camera. You've already set up the camera before this because you've only got 15 minutes. So you've composed your shot and the poor subject's been sitting there whilst you're doing this whole chemical process, keeping the pose. And um, then they would expose it, 
and take the plate out again and go through the developing process, which again involved pouring developer onto the plate fast and continuous and then eventually getting to a wash. So after that whole process you had a, a negative. Um, this is actually a modern negative. It's a, a dry plate but it's pretty similar. It gives you, because of the way it's deteriorated, it actually gives you a bit of a feel for what a wet plate would be like. With all of those corner areas missing information. We do have an actual wet plate, but um, it's something that called an ambrotype. And the only difference with an ambrotype is um, it's made as a one off positive rather than a negative. And that just involves an extra processing step. So, as you can see, it's very easy to make out. It's quite remarkable what happens when you put a layer of black behind it. And so what they would do with ambrotypes, they would put them in a case and put either velvet or paint the back. In this case it's actually being painted but it's eroded away so it's starting to look like the original plate. Now, often these um Advertypes exist today as um, in a damaged state, but looking at them, we often find that it's 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 just the backing paint lacquer that's been scratched rather than the image itself. Um, they were they're also they're often confused with daguerreotypes because the the, the practice. Um, Developed of um, presenting them in a little um, a little case, just like a daguerreotype. And that's also a collodion. It doesn't actually do too well on the visualizer, but it's a collodion tintype. So that's the example I was giving where you use. It's called tintype, but it's actually iron. <laughs> um, or sometimes also ferrotype. So um, again. The whole process is, is being done to produce, and effectively the metal is now like the black. Now do you remember that camera I showed you at the beginning with the nine lenses? Um, it, a lot of these portrait photographers would expose a lot on, on, on a big tin plate, and then um, after they've developed them, um, they would simply cut them up with tinsmiths. So the most common output of the wet plate collodion was something called albumin prints, of which this is one. It's a very thin paper, it's made with egg, egg white, so the albumin process a bit like um, paintings, and um, it was printed in the sun, so what they would do is, uh, eventually there was commercially available paper that would do this, and they would load it into a frame a bit like the negative frames, put the plate directly on top of it and then put it out in the sun and it would literally, once it was sensitised, it would expose in front of you. So you, that's why it was called printing out paper, it would actually print itself. I found this little quote about uh, uh, several chemicals used in the process are extremely hazardous, extremely poisonous, carcinogenic extremely flammable, potentially explosive, in that sense at all. <laughs> One thing we didn't touch on was um, the, the presence of potassium cyanide, uh, which is a deadly poison, um, and the special care required when using this chemical. Mm. Um, That's in the, in the wet plate collodion. Yeah, so acetic acid involved in the um, the collodion mix. In the, in the collodion. And um, if it's not washed off completely, the, the acid um, can react with the, with the fixer and um, liberate potassium cyanide. Cyanide um, gas. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so there's uh, small amounts mm. of hydrogen cyanide are continually released uh, from the potassium cyanide solution. This chemical must be used only in a, in a well-ventilated area. Fortunately, um, they came up with a better... Similar results way. can be obtained by using safer 
fire sulfate fixes. So getting back to what I said in the introduction that um, there's a certain amount of risk taking involved in, mm. and, and personal choice of photographers um, w whether they're going to use the dangerous uh, photochemicals or, or go for a safer one. And they do claim that the potassium cyanide does actually render richer tones. So there was a, a genuine reason for using it even after the safer technique came about. And you could easily obtain these chemicals. There was, there was no difficulty in purchasing them at all. I, I pulled this off the web, and it's um, uh, Health and Safety in the Arts, and this section is on photography chemicals, and it runs to 11 pages and, you know, quite, quite dense spreadsheets um, listing all the chemicals that are used in photography, and um, fortunately with digital we don't have to worry about them now. So there's um, one more process that's kind of related to the others, um, cyanotypes, which also use cyanide, and they're most commonly recognised by their wonderful, what they call Prussian blue colour, which you can't see on the visualiser. Ah. <laughs> so I'd definitely invite you to come down and have a look, if you can see it at all the light coming down. They're actually very, very blue. Um, and that's how they're recognised. If you ever see a blue photograph, it's probably a cyanotype. And the process has been around for quite a while. This is something you're probably familiar with, with um, architects' um, blueprints. Um, yes. It's the same process. Yes. So there's some pretty dangerous chemicals involved with that too, isn't there, Sean? There are. There's, um, well, the first one, there's two really. Ammonium citrate is not really dangerous. In fact, it's, it's often been called a dietary supplement. Um, but when you combine, and that's sort of a green goo, and when you combine that with the potassium cyanide, or the ferric cyanide, mm -hmm. then you get the wonderful combination that makes, basically, you, you paint it onto a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be special photographic paper. You can print cyanotypes on anything, including canvas or clothing. So you paint it on, and again, you'd make it light sensitive, put it in the dark, and then when you're ready, expose it, and then develop it. And you get this wonderful, rich colour. Mm -hmm. But during that process of preparing it, that's when you can get the, the cyanide if the temperature's too high. Mm -hmm. So it's not the sort of thing you want to do without good airflow. Mm -hmm. In conventional, certainly most techniques use silver nitrate, mm -hmm. but in the case of the, the cyanotypes, they're looking for alternative ways. It's basically an, a sensitised iron, effectively. So they're, they're often known as iron photographs. Just reading through the literature, I'm fascinated by um, some of the uses that the chemicals have been put to in the past. And, and um, the uh, collodion, for instance, was uh, used for treating wounds, um, mm. slapped uh, because it was a, a syrupy um, sort of um, solution and, and eventually congealed and, and, and dried, um, it, it was used to um, protect wounds dur during warfare. So perhaps there was um, a medical van at the Crimea as well as Fenton's photographic van with, mm -hmm. with Collodium there as well for treating the wound. Borrow some chemicals from yeah. now. Yeah. And I, I think Sean and I would like to um, just return right to the beginning and and say that you know with with digi the digital revolution we've um, we've liberated ourselves from the need for all these uh, handling all these dangerous chemicals. Um, but funnily enough. <clears throat> there's been a reaction um, and, and there's a renaissance of interest in the old processes. These 19th century ones, the and, more dangerous um, ones. It, some of them are becoming you know, like there's, there's clubs and individuals um, practicing daguerreotypy and, um, and the wet plate process. And, um, but for a lot of the things, we, we found alternative chemicals now. Mm. And, um, Such as for um, daguerreotypes, instead of mercury, they use Bequerel yeah. as an alternative. 
to mercury. And um, the whole process is more or less the same. They've just they've found substitutes that, again, don't produce quite as good a result, but are a lot safer. So that's how alternative photography is kind of now pushing the, the chemical side of photography, whilst the mainstream have all gone digital. It's more of an enthusiast um, group, but or a bit nostalgic as well. But certainly, the quality of some of these techniques is very unique. You know, I mean, particularly something like a cyanotype, you can't you can't easily you can replicate that digitally, but it's not quite the same as knowing that you've actually gone through the motions and made something chemically. So there's there's a, an almost romantic big industry coming, where I imagine within a few years you might start to see some private manufacturers start making alternative chemical processes available just to help the revival. The sort of photographers that we attracted to that are, are, are they're artists, you know, they're looking for mm. aesthetic effects and if we just think about artists as a, as a broad category, um, there's a lot of artists using um, resins and, and um, paint pigments and things that, that have got dangerous chemicals in them too. So uh, artists in general mm. are exposed to lots of probably one of the chemicals. most famous um, types of print, which I don't know, if, I don't think we have any of them. Um, platinum prints were very famous as fine art because they tended to allow less control. They they faithfully repeated what the camera or the photographer captured. It's almost like a direct print and you can even choose the paper, you, you effectively make it sensitive and you get very rich tones. So quite often a few, uh, the more artistic photographers would go heavily for those sort of processes that were more about an artistic result than banging out a whole lot of portraits for a commercial purpose. Well, We'd very much like to invite you to come down and have a look. <laughs>